Hi, my name is Dr. Sheena Cruikshank and I'm a senior immunologist at the University of Manchester. I got a bottle of kombucha tea today, I hope I've said that correctly. Uh, can probiotics help my immune system and if so, how? So there's a couple of things to say here. So I had a little look, I hadn't heard of kombucha tea and it sort of looks like this is some kind of cocktail that's made of um, so we've got bacteria and yeast extract in, in it and actually there's absolutely no evidence at all that it can help your immune system or your health and in fact because of the way it's made in some places there's actually evidence that it can make you quite poorly so this is not to be recommended because there's nothing to suggest it's good there's only things to suggest it's bad however probiotics there is a real mixed bag of evidence there for them. So probiotics are basically things that are helpful bacteria that may kind of benefit the bacteria in your body. You have a substantial bacteria that live in your body, something like 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in each person. So probiotics can be helpful um, in things like gut conditions, they, they, there's certainly some evidence there that they're beneficial. Um, and we've got a, a study out which has been looking at probiotics in skin healing and they look like they have some components of some probiotics like lactobacilli seem to be helping um, wound healing um, aspects of keratinocytes, the sort of cell surface on your skin. They seem to help them um, heal and be able to fight off other infections. However, the evidence is really mixed, so it depends on the scenario that you look at the probiotics on. And also there's a big issue with the probiotics that we can buy, whether or not they're actually a good blend of probiotics that will actually get to the places that they need to, like your gut, and survive. Um, and because there's a lot of sort of patents and things out there, so we don't always know what we're getting. In some incidences, Probiotics can help, but the ones that we can buy over the counter may not always be the right ones to do. So I think use them, but don't expect them to be miracle workers. So we've got two related questions here. What do you think about the idea that we are too clean? And is there an evolutionary reason for the high prevalence of allergies or are they caused by the modern environment? And these things are actually a bit linked, even though they may not sound that they're linked. So we have seen that there has been an increase in allergies, particularly in developing countries. And that's something that we've seen in the 20th century and onwards. And the reason for this isn't quite clear, but a scientist um, proposed a theory called the hygiene hypothesis. And this is a scientist called Strachan, and his idea was that he noticed if you came in from a country environment and you had a lot of brothers and sisters, you were much less likely to get an allergy than if you came from the city or you had a very small family unit, so maybe you were an only child. And he suggested that this was because we had less exposure to bugs when in our developing life. That stopped our immune system from being educated and made us more likely to react to things that we shouldn't react to. Um, this idea has sort of developed a bit more because what we've noticed is in developing countries there are very few allergies and these countries still have a lot of worm infections and the worm infections we now think might actually be protecting you against allergies. So people are now looking to see whether worms can actually be beneficial. So the idea is that perhaps we adapted to deal with the worm, we got rid of the worms about 100 or so years ago, and now our immune system is misfiring and responding to things that it shouldn't respond to. So I think that answers that question. Okay, so I don't know if this is a really serious question, but who would win in a fight between Superman's macrophages and Batman's macrophages? So I think the first thing to say here is Superman isn't human. So it's not really clear that he would have any macrophages. So that's a bit of an issue. So if we assume that they're both human, then I guess because Superman's got these souped up powers, his macrophages might be better than Batman's. However, is Batman better than Superman? There's going to be a whole film on this. Batman doesn't need special powers 
to do his job, he's able to kick ass without them. So maybe his macrophages would actually be the best ones. Who can say? They need to make a new movie about it. Do babies inherit their immune system from their parents? This is a really great question, actually. So it's quite a complicated um, answer, so I'll try and answer it as best as I can. So the, it's not a clear yes or a no. So basically, you do inherit some components of your immune system from your parents. So the basic things that will make up your barrier defense and help you stop getting a lot of bugs in. Also, we know that some immunodeficiencies, so people who can't respond to certain things, are inherited from their parents. However, there is a lot of variability in the immune response, and this is because we have um, education and checkpoints um, in our immune system to enable us to have a very wide repertoire to respond to almost anything that we meet, and this happens after we are born. So for example, if you take something like the T cells, they are able to respond to something like 10 to the 11 different things, which is kind of astonishing. And this is because they are polymorphic genes. So they've done a study recently, it just came out in Cell, I think at the beginning of the year, and it looked at twins. So if you go and look in twins, this is the best way to decide whether it's genetics or environment and what they noticed is actually it's your environment that's the biggest determinator of your immune system so it's the things that you're exposed to so for example twins might not respond the same to the same vaccine or the same disease and that variance will even sort of get even wider the older they get so it's it's the things they're exposed to the things they eat and their microbiota, all sorts of things will shape their immune system. Will the malaria vaccine work and why is it taken so long to produce? So this is a really interesting question. You're absolutely right, the malaria vaccine has been taking a long time. This has been the focus of an absolutely huge amount of work. So part of the reason for, for, the, for the fact that there are things that don't have vaccines yet, like malaria, is because we don't fully understand the immune response to them and we it's much harder to understand the immune response when you don't have people who are what we call sterilely immune so they are completely immune so if you know somebody who's completely immune then you can understand why they're immune and then you can kind of mimic that also they have a very complicated lifestyle life cycle so malaria has um, about four life cycle stages. It has life cycle stages that are specific to the mosquito. It has life cycle stages once it gets into your blood. And it's only in your bloodstream for a very short time before it hits the liver. And then it changes again. And then it goes back to the blood where it looks different again. So each time it looks different and you have to have a different immune response to it. And it's also a very variable parasite and lots of other pathogens are very, very variable as well. And that also creates a problem because which bit would you want to mimic when you're trying to create a vaccine to create the best type of immune response? So the most successful malaria vaccine candidate was actually irradiating whole parasites and giving them to people. But of course, that's not very practical because you would need an awful lot of parasites to be able to uh, protect people. So what they've done is they've taken um, components of the parasite that they know will give you a good antibody response and a good T-cell response and they do seem to be providing some protection. It's not complete protection but the real, the, the goal here has to be trying to reduce the severity of the disease. So where, where malaria is particularly problematic is when it causes symptoms like cerebral malaria, which are very, very serious. And I think that's where it's looking most promising. So it's not going to give complete protection, judging by the data that we've got, but it's, it's going to be better than nothing and hopefully will provide some protection to those people that need it. Next question is, why do we not have as good a smell as, say, a dog? And what creature has the best sense of smell? Well, in fact, our sense of smell is a lot better than we think. And uh, I do, 
I, I do public engagement experiments in which I show people that they can detect the difference between two smells that differ by just one atom of carbon. So in fact, you've got an atomic nose. You can tell the difference between two molecules, one of which has got seven carbons in it, and the other's got eight. The difference is very subtle, but people can tell that difference. So you do have a very good sense of smell.